So in this video, I'm going to be talking about pleural fluid, which is accumulation of fluid in between the lung and the chest wall, which can cause shortness of breath. But specifically, I'm going to be talking about procedure we do to remove that fluid that is called the thoracentesis. We're going to be talking about the possible causes of the fluid buildup. We're going to talk how do we differentiate the possible causes. We're going to explain how we do the thoracentesis procedure, what are the possible complications, and what to expect after the procedure. Normally, the lung is fully expanded and touching the chest wall, and you have a thin layer of fluid between the lung and the chest wall, like a little bit of oil to lubricate the movement. Yeah, normally there is only a few cc's of fluid in that space, but when you start building up fluid and fluid accumulates, it could get up to two or three liters even, and that will cause shortness of breath. Also, some patients could develop cough that can become pretty difficult to tolerate. When you have a large amount of fluid, it's hard for patients to lie down. Usually they need to sit up so they can breathe. Obviously, when the fluid accumulation happens fast, patients can notice pretty fast, but sometimes when it happens over time, it's harder to tell. People notice they cannot do the same things they were able to do before and they're getting more short of breath, but they don't know if they're just tired or what's going on. And what causes the fluid buildup around the lungs? So the fluid buildup can be caused by a failure of an organ. For example, heart failure is the most common cause, but it also can happen with a kidney failure or even with a liver failure or cirrhosis, you can develop fluid around the lung. Fluid buildup in the lung can also be secondary to an infection in the lung, like pneumonia. When you have pneumonia, it may irritate the pleura and leak fluid into the space. Another significant cause of especially large pleural effusions is if you have a cancer that is involving the lung or the pleural space. In some situations, tuberculosis can also cause a large pleural effusion. But other things can cause pleural effusions, including autoimmune diseases like lupus, for example, or even a blood clot in the lungs can create a pleural effusion. But obviously, when you're first diagnosed with a pleural effusion, one of the most important things is to find the cause so it can be treated and prevent a repeat fluid accumulation. So one of the most important steps in relieving the symptoms and also finding out what is the cause is to do this procedure called a thoracentesis. And a thoracentesis is a very simple procedure. Essentially, it's a procedure where we insert a needle in the pleural space, in the area of the fluid, and we then connect this needle to a vacuum bottle or some suction device to remove the fluid. And this is a procedure we more often do in the office and often one of our PAs or nurse practitioners can do this procedure as well. And again, it's a fairly quick and simple procedure. You do not really need to prepare. We just use local anesthesia, so you don't need to be fasting, but you need to let us know if you are on blood thinners. If you are on blood thinners, ideally we would stop before the procedure, but in some situations that there is more risk of stopping the blood thinners and leading to a blood clot than actually doing the procedure on blood thinner since it's a very low risk procedure. Most of the time, the fluid accumulates mostly in the back. So we usually we do this procedure with the patient sitting on a bed and usually laying their arms over a table to open the ribs. The patient is usually leaning slightly forward. We then use an antiseptic to clean the area of the thoracentesis. We'll use an ultrasound to identify where the fluid is. Then using the ultrasound, we'll choose a spot to do the thoracentesis. And we usually numb the skin and the chest wall with lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic that works really, really fast. We then wait a few seconds for the lidocaine to work. And then we use a slightly bigger needle to do the thoracentesis. We then introduce the needle in the pleural cavity in the fluid using ultrasound guidance. Once the needle is in and the fluid is draining out, we then connect to a vacuum bottle and drain the fluid relatively slowly. Most patients only feel mild pressure and the procedure only takes about 10 to 20 minutes. We're then gonna have to decide how much fluid we're actually gonna drain. It will depend how much fluid you have and if you're tolerating well the drainage. Now, some patients may develop cough while we're draining and that may be a reason for us to stop. Other patients may develop some chest pressure and then if that happens, we usually have to stop. It's usually at the end of the drainage though. The cough and the chest tightness could last for 30 minutes to an hour after the procedure, but it, you will get better. If you're not getting better, then you need to give us a call. It's important to know that obviously if the pain and the shortness of breath are actually getting worse, which is very unusual, 
then you need to call us because something could be going wrong and we may need to do a chest x-ray. Once we collect the fluid, then we'll send for a battery of tests. Most likely, you also need to do a blood test because we compare the blood tests in the blood to the tests in the fluid to help us differentiate the possible causes of the pleural effusion. So we'll send the fluid for cell count and differential to see not only how many cells are there, but what are the types of cells. We're also gonna send the fluid for a test called protein and another test called LDH, which will help us differentiate the causes of the fluid. We send for pH and glucose levels, because if both are very low, that indicates an infection. We obviously will send for cytology, which is a test where the pathologist looks under the microscope to see if there is any cancer cells in there. And we send for microbiology to check not only for bacterial infections, but also tuberculosis and fungal infections, right? At the same time and in the same laboratory, we also have to collect a sample of blood in the same day and the same lab to send for protein and LDH tests. We will compare those values to the values of the fluid to determine if this is a transudate or exudate, and we'll get into that. The easiest way to put this is a transudate is a very thin fluid. It's mostly water. Whether an exudate is a fluid that contains cells and inflammatory markers. So a transudate is usually caused by heart failure or liver failure or kidney failure. Whether an exudate could be caused by an infection or a cancer or an autoimmune disease. So broadly, it really helps us to differentiate between these large groups. And here's the criteria that we use to differentiate a transudate to an exudate. In the transudate, the protein in the fluid divided by the protein in the blood is less than 0.5. So the protein in the fluid is 50% of or less than the protein in the blood. And obviously if it's an exudate, then the protein in the fluid is more than 50% of the protein in the blood. The LDH is also a criteria, and if the LDH in the fluid divided by the LDH in the blood is less than 0.6 or 60%, then this is considered a transudate. If the opposite, if it's higher than 0.6 or higher than 60%, then it's considered an exudate. Another criteria is if the LDH in the fluid is lower than two thirds of the maximum value of the blood, maximum normal value for that lab, then indicates a transudate. But if it's more than two thirds of the normal values, then would indicate an exudate. The cell count in the fluid is also helpful in differentiating between transudate and exudate. And the way we use this is if the cell count in the fluid is less than 1,000 cells, that's suggestive of a transudate. And also those cells are not usually neutrophils. They're usually a combination of some lymphocytes and macrophages. That points to a transudative diagnosis. Again, CHF, liver failure, renal failure. Now, if the cell count is high, more than 1,000, it's usually suggestive of an exudate. And now we have to look also what cells are mostly present. If it's neutrophils, then it indicates that it's likely a bacterial infection, like a pneumonia-related pleural effusion or something like that. If it's mostly lymphocytes, then would indicate either tuberculosis or a cancer or potentially even like an autoimmune disorder like lupus or rheumatoid. Now, if it ends up being eosinophils, then it points more like to a drug reaction or something like that. None of these alone make the diagnosis, but they are helpful in pointing us in one direction or the other, but we have to put the whole clinical picture together, of course. After the procedure, uh, most often we don't even do a chest X-ray if everything went well, because we did this under imaging guidance and we're pretty confident that everything went well. However, if you're having pain or something is abnormal, we will do a chest x-ray to check. And then we'll watch you for a little bit, but most people can go home almost right away, especially if they're feeling better. Obviously, if they're having pain or they're having more shortness of breath or there's an issue, we'll keep and watch them longer. Like I said, some patients may have cough and chest tightness for about half an hour to an hour after the procedure, but that should be improving over time. It's common to be a little sore at the site. You can also have a sharp pain when you take a deep breath, but that should be resolved in a few hours. But here are the warning signs. If you go home and you start having more and more pain or the shortness of breath is getting worse 
or you develop fever or pass out, you need to call us back or go immediately to the NER to get a chest x-ray and see what's going on. What are the possible complications of tarsentesis? The complications are, are pretty rare, of course, because we do a lot of this under imaging guidance and we're obviously very careful. But complications could include a bleeding complication from usually from an intercostal artery. They usually would present with a severe chest pain and sometimes low blood pressure. Another complication potentially if the needle touched the lung would be that air would escape from the lung and collect between the lung and the chest, causing also a lung collapse called a pneumothorax. That's also very rare, but of course, if that happens, you would require what's called a chest tube, which is a little straw that we put between the lung and the chest to remove that air. Now, in some situations, people can have what's called a trapped lung. That's when your lung has been collapsed for so long that when you take the fluid out, it doesn't really expand. So then when you take the fluid out, that area can fill with air and may look like what's called a pneumothorax, but it's not really causing a lung collapse. The air is just replacing where the fluid was. But the way to differentiate is usually the patients, if that happened, they're actually feeling better. Their shortness of breath is either the same or improved after the procedure. Whether if somebody developed a pneumothorax from an air leak, they will have severe shortness of breath. There's another complication called a re-expansion pulmonary edema. And that may happen when you remove a large amount of fluid at once, which in general we try to avoid. But if that happens, the way it presents is severe cough and shortness of breath that is not improving right away. That may require hospitalization and treatment with diuretics to improve the breathing. But it's certainly a reversible thing and will get better. It is very rare. You know, I've been an interventional radiologist for 20 years and I've only seen this once or twice, usually in hospitalized patients, which are usually very sick, of course. I know I'm telling you all these complications, but most of the time, thoracentesis is actually a very simple procedure and an easy way to relieve shortness of breath and also find out what is the cause for the fluid buildup. I hope this was helpful to you, but if you have any questions, you can contact our office.